The last time we talked about NASCAR on this channel, I made the case that Alan Quickie might be the most influential NASCAR driver of all time. By winning a few races in a championship as an owner driver, he convinced some big names to go down the same route and try things his way and fly their own colors as owner drivers. And although some of them saw some early success, all of them failed in the long run, and none of them ever hoisted the cup at season's end. But when it comes to the lower divisions of NASCAR, there is one man that set the entirety of NASCAR's feeder system back by about a decade. One guy got in everybody's heads that it was in their best interest to do double or triple duty and not only race in the Cup Series, but also run in the second tier series full time and run most of the third tier series races on top of that. During this time, new talent was stifled and the same old faces always ended up in victory lane. Teams now had no new talent coming down the pipe and all of NASCAR just seemed frozen in time for nearly a decade. This one guy isn't entirely to blame at first, but later he makes sure to drive the final nail home and forces NASCAR to do something about it. They say some men are born into greatness, while others have to go out and fight for it and seize it for themselves. But others still end up having greatness foisted upon them whether they want it or not. One man who falls into that last category is Kevin Harvick, because through no fault of his own at first, he completely broke the NASCAR feeder system. The NASCAR feeder system is a lot more complex than most other sports. In football, for instance, you play in high school and collegiate ball, then you either get drafted in the NFL or you go into free agency and just hope to high heaven that somebody gives you a phone call at some point. The NASCAR feeder system, on the other hand, looks something like this. You begin in the weekly series, then hopefully get picked up for a regional ride. If you do well there, then you can move up to ARCA, then to trucks, then to the Xfinity series, and finally the Cup series. There are some side divisions that could leapfrog you up the ladder faster, or if you're an established veteran in IndyCar or Formula 1, you could just skip straight to the top. But on the whole, the system is supposed to be completely merit-based. You earn your ride to the top division for the most part. In most other sports, there are rules stipulating that a player in the highest division cannot drop down to the lower division and play there while still playing in the top division. A Major League Baseball pitcher, for instance, cannot drop down and pitch in minor league games on his off days. If he's caught doing that, he'll be banned for life from the MLB. Likewise, LeBron James, who was drafted in the NBA straight out of high school, cannot play for a college team even if he was to call it quits as a pro. Because once you play basketball at a professional level, you can never go back and play at the collegiate level. However, he has said that he would like to play football for Ohio State, and I'm not sure what the rules are if you decide to switch sports. That would be wild, though. However, in motorsports, there have usually been pretty open-ended rules in regards to dropping down to the lower divisions. During the 60s, it was totally normal to have Formula 1 drivers race in Formula 2 races the day before. IndyCar drivers during the same time frame were likewise free to run sprint car races and silver crown races if they wanted to. And NASCAR has always let drivers in the Cup Series, its highest division, run in the Sportsman's Convertible, Modified, Xfinity, and Truck Series. For NASCAR, it was seen as a way to get their eyes on the lower divisions. If Curtis Turner wanted to go run the Convertible Series, for instance, then they should just let him. After all, he was a big draw and that would get more people interested in those races. But the biggest temptation for Cup Series drivers has always been the Second Tier Series, originally known as the Sportsman Series and now the Xfinity Series. A good chunk of the schedule for the Secondary Series has always been companion races, racing on the same track as the Cup Series drivers on the same weekend as a preliminary event the Saturday before the Big Show on Sunday. The Xfinity Series was originally sponsored by Bush Beer and was called the Bush Series from 1982 to 2007. Thus, the practice of Cup Series guys dropping down to the Bush Series was called bushwhacking. And in the 90s, there was no bigger king of bushwhacking than Mark Martin. Pretty much every single week the Cup Series and Bush Series were at the same track, he'd race in both events. He won a staggering 46 times in the Bush Series while pulling double duty from 1988 to 2011. That's just an insane span of time. What's even more insane was that in 1993 he won four Cup Series races in a row. Most people know about that, but the crazy part was in between those four wins. He won three Bush Series races during that time as well. Mark Martin entered and won seven NASCAR races in a row. Mark Martin did not invent bushwhacking, arguably Darrell Waltrip, Harry Gant, and Dale Earnhardt's exploits in the lower divisions coined the term, but Mark Martin took the concept to new heights, to the point that many people in the 90s, my parents and grandparents included, were arguing that there should be some sort of rule in place to limit it. My grandma even went so far as to stop calling the Bush Series the Bush Series and instead insisted it be called the Winston Cup Light Series. As much as Mark Martin dominated the second tier series, he only ever entered about half the races or so during a given season. So there was still plenty of room for guys like Johnny Benson, Jason Keller, and Randy LaJoy to flex their muscle and have solid careers there. But all that changed in 2001. Enter one Kevin Harvick from Bakersfield, California. Harvick cut his teeth in the brimming southwestern short track scene. 
and eventually won the title for the NASCAR Southwest Tour in 1998, a precursor to the ARCA West Tour today. In 1999, he gets tapped to make his first Bush Series start for Richard Childress Racing at Rockingham. In 2000, he goes full-time and has immediate success, winning three races and finishing the year third in points. In 2001, the game plan is to make a push for the Bush Series Championship and await a full-time ride that could open up in the Cup Series either in 2002 or 2003. That didn't happen, though. We all know the story of how Harvick got his ride in the Cup Series. At the 2001 Daytona 500, Dale Earnhardt Sr. died tragically on the last lap battling to make sure his two drivers, Michael Waltrip and his son, Dale Jr., would secure a 1-2 finish. Earnhardt's car owner, Richard Childress, was devastated. Dale had been driving for him for nearly 20 years straight. The two weren't business partners, they were basically family at that point. Childress was so distraught that he wanted to cease operations right then and there, but he has multi-million dollar sponsorship contracts to oblige and nearly 100 people on payroll who rely on this team's operations as their primary source of income. The show must go on. They paint the car white and change the number, but they have to find a guy to put behind the wheel. The only problem is there aren't a whole lot of candidates. What about Kevin Harvick then? Well, he's in his second full-time Bush Series season and has million dollar sponsorships there to fulfill too. They can't just cut him from that program. So he'll have to do something nobody has ever really done before. He'll have to run both the Winston Cup Series and the Bush Series full-time simultaneously. Now in years past, this would have been logistically impossible. But in 2001, as luck would have it, NASCAR has completely revamped the Busch Series schedule. Just three years ago, the Busch Series ran 20 of 31 races as companion races to the Cup Series. The other 11 races were Myrtle Beach, South Boston, Hickory, Gateway, the Nashville Fairgrounds, and a whole host of other tracks that were far away from the Cup guys. In 2001, there are now 33 races, and only 9 are non-companion events. And most of them are scheduled so they don't conflict with a NASCAR Cup race happening somewhere else. Or if they do, they're at least on the same side of the country. It's a tall, tall order, but it is possible despite the fact that the Cup Series has also expanded its schedule, from 34 to 36 races. Kevin Harvick will have to take a bunch of private jet flights from one state to another and drive two completely different cars on 29 different tracks across 10 months of competition. But the 25-year-old says he's good for it. Alright kid, go out there and show us what you got. Best of luck to you. Holy shit! Okay, dude, you didn't have to flex on us that hard, but okay. Two wins in the Cup Series and five wins in the Bush Series. He won Rookie of the Year in Cup and won the championship in the Bush Series. To this day, he's the only guy to have ever done that. Not only that, but he finished ninth in the Cup Series standings despite missing the first race of the year. No playoffs, no points reset, no nothing. He straight up beat 16 other drivers in the points who ran the full 36 races. Happy Harvick is here to stay, ladies and gentlemen but his first win in the Cup Series pretty much cemented him as a fan favorite right off the bat. He won in Atlanta not only in dramatic fashion, but in a way that almost perfectly mirrored Dale Sr.'s win at the exact same race the year prior. It really helped heal the hearts of NASCAR fans all over the country. In 2002, Harvick would focus on the Cup Series primarily and go the Mark Martin route of bushwhacking only at companion races. But Harvick had accidentally showed everybody that if you wanted to run double duty, you could totally do it and have a lot of success. Harvick raked in something like $6.1 million in winnings in 2001 across both series. The only other driver that made more than him was Jeff Gordon, who won the championship that year. So Harvick had opened the door for the lower division to be completely infiltrated by top division drivers. So who was the first to bite? Well, none other than Kevin Harvick himself. In 2006, he ran double duty for the second time in his career, and this time it was no accident. It was a completely deliberate act. But he did have his partners in crime. Carl Edwards, Paul Menard, J.J. Yaley, Denny Hamlin, Clint Boyer, Kyle Busch, and a few others either ran the entire 35-race schedule or damn near the whole schedule. For J.J., Denny, Menard, and Clint, they were also in the midst of their rookie season in the Cup Series, and apparently their bosses saw what Harvick had done five years earlier and said, hey, he can go out and do that, you can too. The top 10 in points at the end of the year only had one non-full-time Cup guy, Johnny Sauter, who would go full-time in the Cup Series next year. Harvick won the Bush Series title again, big surprise, and he did it by a staggering 824 points, at a time when the maximum points you could score was 185. By mid-season, he was so far ahead that it was a foregone conclusion that he would be the champion, and any excitement for the championship hunt was effectively smothered in the cradle by the time summer came around. Did Harvick's Cup Series performance dip at all during this time? No, not in the slightest, actually the opposite. He had the best season of his career up to that point. If once was a fluke, then twice was a pattern, and everybody picked up on it this time. 
From 2006 to 2010, all the champions in the Busch Series were Cup Series regulars. Kyle Busch and Brad Keselowski won their first NASCAR titles this way before they ever became Cup Series champions. They effectively crowded out any up-and-coming talents by hogging rides in the lower divisions and stealing the spotlight. And they won these championships by huge margins. It wasn't even fun to watch anymore. Not to mention, actually witnessing a Bush Series regular win a Bush Series race was rarer than winning the frickin' lottery. From 2006 to 2010, the Bush Series ran 175 races, and only 11, count them, 11 were won by guys who were not full-time Cup Series regulars. Hell, one of those 11 didn't even count. Eric Almirola won at the Milwaukee Mile because he had started the car, but Denny Hamlin was supposed to run that race, but his flight was late because the Cup Series race that week was in Sonoma, California, nearly 2,000 miles away. The sponsor had wanted Denny in their car, so Almirola stepped out and Denny finished the race. That's just how utterly frickin' ridiculous this era of NASCAR was. This right here is what I call the Harvick drought. No Bush Series regulars won championships during this time. Now it was just a playground for the Cup guys. And this even spilled over and hurt the Cup Series in the form of the Rookie of the Year award. With the feeder system being clogged up by Cup guys, the only new drivers that popped up in the Cup Series were guys with sponsorship money who won Rookie of the Year award pretty much by default, as they had no competition. Kevin Conway, Andy Lally, and Stephen Light are all really good guys, I'm sure, but they never really had any luck in the Cup Series because they couldn't find room to build their talents in the lower levels. This dearth of talent caused NASCAR to finally implement some sort of new rule to make sure Cup guys didn't kill off any new talent entering the sport. In 2011, NASCAR announced that drivers would have to declare which series they wanted to score points in. They could still make starts and win races in other series, but they would not be awarded points towards the championship for any undeclared series and you could only declare one. Naturally, the Cup guys declared for the Cup Series, but they still ran nearly all of the races for what is now the Xfinity Series. The schedule had been shaken up again, and pretty much all of the races in the Xfinity Series calendar were companion races. This then led to Austin Dillon winning the title in 2013 despite not winning a single race, the first NASCAR driver to ever do that in any division in the modern era. So in 2017, NASCAR put in another rule that would limit Cup guys to just seven starts in the lower divisions, and later they capped it to five. This then finally let the Xfinity Series flourish as a breeding ground for new talent. You can literally see it right here in the Xfinity Series Champions list and the Cup Series Rookie of the Year award winner. We go from absolute nobodies to real deal stars like William Byron, Tyler Reddick, and Chase Briscoe working their way up through the ranks. The feeder series now work exactly like they're supposed to. The occasional bushwhacker still comes along, but for the most part, Xfinity guys win Xfinity Series races and titles. Those guys then get shots at top division rides, just as God intended. It took a bit of tinkering and some big swings with the rule book, but it eventually came around. The Xfinity series now has its own distinct identity, and we owe it all to this one guy, Kevin Harvick. Because of his heroics in 2001 and his greed in 2006, bushwhacking isn't at all the problem that it was in the 90s or the 2000s. You could argue that he got NASCAR to fix a problem that he himself created, but hey, it all worked out in the end. Harvick still drops down to the lower ranks from time to time, and once even entered an ARCA West race at Kern County Speedway to drum up some publicity for that series. Bushwhacking has its place in the motorsports landscape, and has the right restrictions in place now to help out everybody nowadays. So the next time you're at a lower level NASCAR race and only a handful of Cup Series guys are on the entry list, take time to thank and or blame Kevin Harvick and all the bushwhackers that came before him. Because if they hadn't pushed the NASCAR rulebook to the absolute limit, we'd still be seeing the same faces at every track, every week, in every division. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes, thanks for watching, and until next time, y'all take it easy.